Hi loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing the long-awaited top 2023 books video. It is characteristically late but I love making these videos and they're so good to look back on. So yeah we're going to talk about the best things that I read in 2023. Um, I've done a very long ramble in my written post, reflecting on my reading year, getting the stats out that I like to get out. If you're interested a link to that will be in the description box. But to summarise, I had a really, really good reading year, probably one of the best reading years I've ever had in terms of quality. I actually read quite a lot too. I didn't really have a numerical goal in mind. I thought I would like to read over 50 books really, but beyond that I wasn't too bothered. I think I ended up reading 96 books. And so I've actually been able to be extremely picky with the books that I'm gonna talk to you about in this video. And I narrowed it down to those books that, for whatever reason, I particularly connected with. And this will be for many reasons. There's lots of nigh-on perfect books on my honourable mentions or recommended list, which, again, is in my written post if you want the full list of all the things I think you should read or that I would recommend to the right reader. But yeah, this list that I'm going to share with you today is a little bit more personal I would say and yeah I suspect that the reason why some of these books have stuck with me a bit longer since I read them sort of specifically spoke to me a little bit more than some of the others will be um, genre preference and kind of taste preference, um, theme preference so the things I like to read about and I like to be explored in books. So yeah because I had such a good reading it I was able to really narrow it down to just those that for whatever reason rise to the top of my mind every time someone asks me what was your favourite thing you read this year or if I think to myself like which of these will make it onto my all-time favourites will stand out to me from my bookshelf. So if you have similar taste to me as well, you might feel similarly about some of these books. So the final thing to note I think is that I split these books up into three categories. Usually I would do more of a ranking sort of thing and have a best of the best category but actually this year when I looked at the book pile I wanted to split them into three categories which I think sort of summarise my book taste quite well. The first one being the fantastical and strange i.e. the weird and wonderful um, the second one being, I've, I've called it the soul touching in my current draft of my of my written post. Uh, I may change that because it's a little bit cheesy, but the sort of quiet reflective um, books that I typically really, really enjoy. Um, and yes, moving in some way. I think I called it the soul touching for a particular reason. But anyway, and the final category just being the decidedly enjoyable. Um, I always have a couple of books in there, which I wouldn't say fit necessarily into those categories but are just really well written propulsive books. So as I say I think that summarises my taste quite nicely. We're either looking at the kind of completely wacky or the quiet and the reflective books where nothing much happens at all. <laughs> because of the way I've done my pile here we're also going to do them in a random order, no particular order and yeah let's get started. I also think most of these will come as no surprise to you. There's a couple that I haven't spoken about for a little while but in general I have been waffling on about some of these books quite a lot over the last year. Particularly this first book author trilogy that I discovered this year. I haven't really stopped talking about discovering Robin Hobb and this book is a stand-in for three books, the Farseer trilogy, uh, it's the first trilogy in her long realm of the Elderlings series. I think you can read the first two trilogies interchangeably. You can read The Live Ship Traders first if you prefer, but you need to read both these trilogies before you move on to the next. I started straight from the top. I tend to enjoy starting straight from the top of the publishing history. And I'm going to read The Live Ship Traders this year, but yes, just really good fantasy writing. Psychologically astute and psychologically real feeling. Great characters, lovable characters. If you're wondering, I actually put this one in the decidedly enjoyable category because although it is a fantasy, I wouldn't say it was particularly fantastical or strange. I really like the way the magic system and the fantasy elements are woven into this novel. It feels natural to the world. It is more understated than in some other fantasy. It is very much informed 
by nature and I can't think of a better way to put this but you can tell Robin Hobb is a woman <laughs> in the magic system that she creates but of course this book even though it's in the decidedly enjoyable it has elements of both it has some fantasy elements obviously and it's also quite quiet at times it is quite reflective it moves quite slowly I would say especially not so much this one which is the shortest book in the trilogy this is the first one assassin assassin's apprentice but the um second two particularly the third are quite slow paced so be warned if you don't like slow paced novels but yes robin hobb one of my favorite discoveries of 2023 um thank you so much to all of the robin hobb champions um in our patreon group because that is why i picked up her books this year and they were as wonderful as you described and yes I can't wait to continue on with the realm of the elderlings I think I'm planning to do like a trilogy a year something like that so I can eke it out for as long as possible and they are quite long as well but anyway um this particular trilogy we follow Fitz he's a bastard um and he is accepted into the king's court but of course his mere presence causes ripples and he ends up getting into all sorts of scrapes so yes the ending of the second book i'll never forget it i think it's one of my favorite novel endings i've ever read okay next up this one's firmly in the soul touching category i hate that i've chosen this as the category name i need to think of a better name for it but the soul touching category okay um something about this one just spoke to me i loved it it's in ascension by martin mckinnis it follows lee who is a microbiologist and she is exploring sort of the origins of life uh, and her journey across the whole of the novel takes her from kind of the depths of the sea up into the stars i don't want to speak about the plot too too much because i feel like you need to follow lee's journey um but yeah i i don't think this is a perfect book there are a couple of slightly baggy sections but in a way it actually makes me love this book even more something about this book just feels very personal to me um it feels like a kind of shout out into the universe asking you know can you hear me are you there do you feel like this too that's the feeling that i get from this book i would love to read more of mckinnis's work i think i've got one other of his books on my shelf now it's very ambitious it's a little bit perplexing i think as a group we managed to come up with a really solid theory for this one um through book club because we did this for book club and yeah it was one of my favorite discussions of the year as well so yes that's in ascension talked about this a little bit recently so i won't talk too much about it again but so long see you tomorrow by william maxwell another um great discovery thanks to varsha who brought it to the group and actually sent me this copy as well she championed this book and it was every bit as good as she said it was a beautiful book an old man kind of reflecting on his childhood a friendship that he had a murder in the small town where he grew up and a small moment tiny moment in his life where he feels like he should have and could have acted differently and he didn't and he feels ashamed of that and it brings all of this to the fore and reflecting on grief for his mother who he lost as a boy uh, all of this packed into such a tiny little novel beautifully written wouldn't touch a single word in it just one of those novels which feels like a perfect whole um just writing perfection really and uh it will tear your heart to pieces obviously in the soul touching category i cried like a baby at this one so again very much in the soul touching category <laughs> and this is possession by a.s byard and again i talked about this quite extensively recently so i won't go into too much detail but we follow a couple of academics as they uncover this new information about two victorian poets and they're essentially led down a rabbit hole of finding out what happened between these two people and how it completely changes the study of these two people and the ways their poems are interpreted in the modern day etc etc um, it's a romance uh, but it is an extremely literary romance it is quite dense it's definitely not for everyone this one but I absolutely loved it. And as I say, I got so immersed in it and so attached to the characters that I just cried so, so much by the time I got to the end of it. The achievement in this book as well is unparalleled. The way she manages to create these non-existent Victorian poets out of thin air and, you know, she affords them swathes of really great poetry in the style of a Victorian poet is extremely extremely impressive so yes and I do want to read more by it as well okay Venice Underground most definitely in the fantastical and strange category because this is a very weird book um this was his debut novel which has been republished recently with a new introduction so yeah but even though it's in this category again I found this one quite moving it's this very odd Odyssean tale 
where we follow a character as he descends into Venice underground. Um, the city of Venice itself being very strange and weird and is a sort of super future apocalyptic city. Uh, this character called Quinn is making all of these genetically engineered animals which are sort of taking over Venice. So there's definitely weird stuff going up on up top but Shadrach descends into the underground um, to recover his former lover uh, Nicola. There he finds strange beasts that he must fight and battle uh, and it definitely has that epic quality to it. And also in the sort of episodic nature of it where he moves from one place to another place to another place. And yeah I found the ending to be quite touching um, and in general just the overall nature of the book I found really interesting. Um, I loved there's a little section by Vandermeer which is called yeah the afterward to the first edition and it's really weird it has like a little bit of a story in it and then also uh, a section by Vandermeer himself acknowledging that this is just a story fragment and was the beginning of some of the ideas in Venice and then you know reflecting on the creation of Venice. I just think this sentence summarizes the novel really well and I read it out before and I'm going to read it out again. Fed by fragments the reader cannot see but can sense, by visions and transformations, by cross-pollination with other story cycles, it is a mutt, a mongrel, but to me oddly beautiful nonetheless. And yeah, in that sense as well, I find it a really interesting novel, especially as a lover of Vandermeer's work. I wouldn't start here, but if you do like Vandermeer's work, I do recommend this one. I think the sense of like fragments that the reader cannot see but can sense is very much a sort of theme with some of these books as well. It's a little bit how I would describe that feeling I have of Innocentian being this cry out into the void and being quite a personal novel. It's just a feeling I get from the book, something I can sense more than I can sort of point to a specific thing in the book. I reread Pew by Catherine Lacey this year. We did it for book club way, way back about this time last year. It was wonderful again and made for a great discussion and is definitely one of my all time favorite books. It is very weird and uncanny and touches on so many interesting topics again in a really short space. Um, it follows a character who wakes up on a pew in a church in the American South and they are of no discernible race, age or gender. Um, they have no origin that they can remember so we're in that character's head but they can't remember anything either. Uh, I found it the second time round to be much more rooted than the in the American South than I remembered before. Before I thought of it as this parable and I was mostly focused on the character of Pew and this time I was more focused on what's happening around Pew. But I think both readings are really interesting. And yeah, it will definitely make you think this one. It's strange. It has this baffling ending that requires a little bit of interpretation and thought, I think, to get the most out of it. Um, but it is, yeah, absolutely wonderful. I reread Broken Earth this year, so I had to put it in this video, of course, but how much more can I talk about these ones? I've talked about them so, so much. These are just great. They're going to be future classic um, sci-fi fantasy novels for sure. The ideas in here are unmatched. The world is really unique. In it, there's a group of characters who can manipulate the earth, um, quell shakes, but also start shakes. So much interesting stuff born of that idea about um, the world, the ground beneath our feet and power dynamics and race uh, just all blend together perfectly in these books and I highly, highly recommend them. Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, a non-fiction which is firmly in the soul-touching category. This is just gorgeous. So the subtitle is Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants. And in it, Kimura blends uh, her scientific knowledge with her indigenous background. She is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and also memoir, just um, recollections of her life as a mother um, and living on land herself in the sort of in betweeny space that she occupies as both scientist and indigenous woman. I think it's impossible to read this book and not come away from it changed in some way. I read it um, during springtime. In fact, I didn't read it, I listened to it. She reads it. I listened to it during springtime. It was just the most wonderful experience. I highly, highly recommend it. It also taught me so much about what I like in nonfiction, 
um, and what works for me in non-fiction so just such a valuable reading experience. Into my soul touching category comes another fantasy um, and that is Gifts specifically from the Annals of the Western Shore trilogy. I just listened to this, I don't know it, how to describe it but again I found it to be very moving. We follow two teenagers in these bleak uplands of the Western Shore and every family has its own gift or witchcraft and unfortunately instead of using it to help one another they use it against one another and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of division and a kind of feudal society is created and we're following two teenagers using their gift in other ways discovering what their true gifts really are what the meaning of the gift is uh, the power and beauty of storytelling um, yeah, I don't know, it's something I think too about the narration of this book it felt like just this quiet burbling stream of humanness and the difficulty of growing up and coming to terms with your upbringing, your environment, your family, um, what you've been given, what you haven't been given. Um, yeah, just loved it. The more I think about gifts, the more I want to reread it. Um, it was my favourite of the three. I would recommend the whole trilogy 100%. They, they are, it doesn't like follow the same characters throughout, although it's obviously set in the same world and does have some tie-ins. Each one is can be read as a standalone. Um, I do recommend reading them in order though. Something about gifts just felt very poignant to me. Two Toni Morrisons. I read a lot of Morrison this year and all of it was wonderful. <laughs> I would recommend all of it and it's just all impeccable. Um, but these two particularly I loved. This one I put in the fantastical and strange category and this one in the soul touching. Even though this one doesn't feel a little bit different from some of the others. It's not quite as quiet I wouldn't say. But I did feel really moved by Paradise. So let's talk about Sula first. Um, Sula is strange and uncanny and weird. I listened to this um, and it was wonderful listening to Morrison's voice tell this tale. I mean, this is just a perfect piece of writing. The plot marries perfectly with the themes, with the characters, with the pacing and the way the story unfolds. It's very artfully done. Um, at a sentence level, it's stunning. We follow two girls who grow up to be very, very different, but they have this shared girlhood together. And one of them settles down into a traditional family life. And the other is a bit of a scandalous character in the town. You know, she goes about her own business and is much more independent. And they also have this shared secret, this kind of terrible thing that they did as children. There's lots going on here. I'm just always amazed. Again, this novel is very short, but she packs so much in here. Really revealing the strangeness of life and of relationships uh, and it's wonderful. If you're wondering where to start with Morrison, I really recommend Sula. It's readable, but it still has all the Morrison qualities to it, but it is a little bit more accessible, I would say, than some of her other work. And it's also one of her best. I always think you should start with the, if you're not going in with a series or something, I always recommend starting with like the best of someone's work. Because I know for some people, they sort of try and save the best for last or whatever, but sometimes that can put you off, it can put you in a reading slump with that particular author. Um, best to start with their best, see if you like them, and then if you want to explore more, you can. Paradise is just absolutely now one of my favourite novels of all time. Um, I think it's an underrated Morrison, it doesn't get talked about as much, but it is fantastic. Um, it's one of her longer books, maybe even her longest book. Song of Solomon is quite long, actually, compared to the others, actually, as well. Yeah, so this follows really a whole town or it's describing a whole town um, and it's an all-black town in rural Oklahoma and so we discover a little bit about the history of that town but also nearby there is a convent and in the convent it was an ex-convent really no longer runs as a convent but in that convent are a selection of women and we discover their backstories as we go through the novel it's one of those books that there's quite a lot of characters. I do recommend making some few notes about who is who and how they're related to one another. Uh, a little bit about the kind of histories and backstories so that you can identify what Morrison is doing in each sentence. Because sometimes sentence to sentence she will flip between timelines, between sort of whole storyline, like mini plot lines. Um, so I found that to be really, really helpful with my reading of this book and also to read it fairly quickly because although it's one of her longer works, you can 
miss some of those little details. And I say that because when you get all of those details, you realise um, just the level of genius that's gone into the plotting of this book and the unfurling, unfolding of its story. Um, and yeah, again, I got very attached to the characters in this book. I felt very strongly for them, with them. It opens with this act of violence by the men in the town towards the women in the convent. And so you open with it and you come back to it at the end. And yeah, I found it very affecting. And I think it is just an absolutely masterful novel. And I loved it. Gilead Now, I'm so excited to continue this series um, this year as well, uh, because Gilead was just such a wonderful reading experience. The whole novel is written as a letter by Reverend John Ames to his son. He had a son quite late in life and so he feels his world is wrapping up and he wants to tell his son about a little bit about himself, um, about his experiences growing up, about his faith. Um, I don't think you need to be religious to read this novel or appreciate it or be Christian. Um, I think John Ames's perception of the world is really beautiful to read. He has a true love of people, of nature, of the world, which I think transcends many faiths and categories. It's a little bit meandering, this book. I personally loved it and almost found it to be a page turner based on that. But for many people, it is a little boring. It is a little too quiet. It is a little too meandering. It doesn't seem to have a place that it's going. But I would argue that it very much does have a place that it's going and that actually it does begin to build some of that tension throughout. Um, I loved the early recollections of Ames's childhood, of his father and his grandfather, who were also both preachers, but in very, very different styles, kind of talking a little bit about generational um, heritage there, and almost like a history of the US as well in some ways. And moving into Ames reckoning with some of the things he feels that are unfinished about his life, or that he feels ashamed about, or that he feels... Um, you know, that he hasn't fully completed. It's wonderful. As I say, can't wait to continue it. Won't be for everyone because it will be a little boring for some, but I absolutely loved it. This is one of the very first books I read last year, but it is fantastic. Very much in the fantastical and strange category, this one. This is China Mievel's The Scar. It's the second book in his Bass Lag trilogy, which is quite a loose trilogy. Again, it's not following exactly the same characters, the same storyline. Um, this has a different feel, I would say, from Perdido Street St Station. So even if you didn't like Perdido Street Station or you couldn't get on with the style of that one because it is quite florid, quite kind of tricksy um, at times, this one is more straightforward. It still has some of Mievel's love of these archaic words and terms and uh, him and Mantel, I'm always writing down the most new vocab for sure. Um, but but still, it, I would say it was more. It's more straightforward. It's also more straightforward in plot. Even though this is a big book, um, the plot was more kind of rollicking. I would say than um, Perdido Street Station and moves a little quicker. Still, maybe not to the extent that um, some readers prefer much more fast paced. But I certainly felt that this one was quite pacey by my standards. Um, and it's about pirates. It's about a pirate city. Um, nobody writes cities like Mieville. If you want good city writing, you have to read some Mieville. It's incredible. Um, it's there in Perdido Street Station. It's there in The City in the City, which I read, didn't like as much as these bass like novels. bass like novels, I want him to return to and write about 500 more because I want to know more about this world. It is fascinating. It is unique. It is populated with unique types of characters. You know, Mieville, again, iconic in the weird genre for doing new things in really interesting ways. His themes are fantastic and clever and interesting and layered. Um, and yeah, I just love him. You know, when I go on about people uh, writing off speculative fiction uh, for being less than literary fiction, I always think of an author like Mieville because he is doing such interesting things with the novel. People just aren't reading him enough. So read some China Mieville. Uh, yeah, like I said, if you didn't get on with Perdido, um, you might still get on with the scar um, and you can read the scar first if you so wish. I think reading them in order is nice. I loved it. I think I want to read the third one this year. The Shipping News by Annie Prue. This was much loved um, on the Patreon. 
and it is just absolutely wonderful. It's one of those books I just want to immediately pick up and read again. I think especially because, and a few of us said this, the first 50 to 100 pages, you're not quite sure if you like it. At least a few of us weren't really convinced on it. It's got this very choppy and um, awkward style to it. It's like it's missing a bunch of words sometimes, like some of her sentences, she's like reduced them right, right, right down um and also turn them back to front sometimes and stuff not that it's like really challenging in the way that um you know some pro stylists are but uh it definitely like it doesn't immediately compute uh it's one of those styles I, th I find Vandermeer is a bit like that sometimes too it like doesn't instantly read or flow um always but once you I don't know what it is whether the style changes slightly or you find the rhythm of it or the just just the story picks up and you're mu and you're kind of more immersed in it, um, but at somewhere between fifty to hundred pages, um, most of us changed our minds. Yeah, it's about Coyle. His wife has just died, and he takes his two daughters and his elderly aunt back to his ancestral home of Newfoundland. Obviously, this is a difficult place to live. Um, you know, it's weather beaten, uh, slightly bleak, and he's living in this small town, and we see all these small town characters and. He comes to life, basically, over the course of the novel, and it's really quite wonderful to see. Do check the trigger warnings for this one, because there's some um, odd, very 90s-ish inclusions. In general, I just think it's beautiful, and there's a couple of images from this book which will stay with me forever. The storytelling, once you're into it, is really engrossing. Um, and, and yes, some of the sentences are just like cut glass. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, and yeah, I want to read more Prue for sure. I love her. We all love her now. I also read Close Range um, last year, which I also thought was wonderful. Okay, a couple of books that I don't have physically. Um, the Strange by Nathan Ballingrid. Um, this is one of those books which, again, almost like the context of the novel interests me just as much as the novel itself, a little bit like Venice Underground. Um, I just, you could so see Ballingrid's love, reverence for sci-fi and westerns with this novel and this nostalgia and love really seeps through its pages in a way that just pleased me um, and made me happy but yeah it's been billed as true grit meets the martian chronicles i've only read true grit i haven't read the martian chronicles but i'm assured that is very accurate it definitely reads close to true grit so um we're following a girl she's living on mars in like the 1940s 50s can't remember somehow humans managed to like land on mars i think it's like in the 1880s or something and by the time we get to the point we're at in the novel colonized mars um in terms of the science it's not very accurate it's not one of those it's not designed to be um it's designed to do something different so if you like your science very accurate this is not the book for you so yeah it's a western but it's also a, a kind of classic sci-fi but it also has these vandermeer-esque weird moments especially was the latter half of the novel but yeah the true great influence is very much there it's got this plucky um abrasive teen girl character which will irritate some readers um she is kind of petulant and shouty um but yeah it absolutely fits like it all fits perfectly within i think what Ballingrid is attempting to do with the book and what he is attempting to pay homage to with the book so it didn't bother me too much at all and there was some beautiful imagery in here just in terms of the way he describes the world um particularly his use of lighting was wonderfully done i found it very charming uh and i can't wait to get my physical copy i don't know why i haven't got a physical copy actually and then we have burnham wood by eleanor catton which is the other book in my decidedly enjoyable category because i don't feel like it quite fits in either of the other two this was also very popular generally amongst us on um, Patreon. Um, it's an eco-thriller set in New Zealand. It brings together this cast of characters that wouldn't usually come into contact with one another over this particular piece of land. The way she writes the first part just felt so relatable to me. It felt so true to life as a kind of millennial, zillennial, whatever I am um, person. She just really embodied the voice of this specific time so well in the first part and she's weaving these characters together very slowly and building up the tension and moving between them very sinuously very seamlessly um 
And so the first part of the novel I actually enjoyed more. I think most people enjoy the second half more where the tension ramps up and we get into the more thrillerish aspects. But I really enjoy all the kind of ground laying that she does in the first half. Um, yeah, some people find it a little bit boring, but I really, really liked it and thought she just captures something of the now there in a really fantastic way that doesn't feel like shoehorned in or weird in ways that writing about modern life can. And yeah, it's just like a solid piece of writing. The story is good, the psychological realism of it is good, and it's enjoyable as well at the same time as exploring a lot of interesting themes and stuff that is obviously relevant to us today. Some people don't like the ending. I am a, I, I am a Burnham Wood ending fan, um, but some people don't like it, but I do like it. And, and yeah, in general, I highly recommend this one to most readers. I think most readers would enjoy it if you can sort of find the flow of it in that first half and, and let yourself be swept up by these characters. That is um, all of my top reads from 2023. So, so many good books in there. Um, and I hope, I can only hope to have another reading year like that one this year. Thank you everyone for watching today. I hope you enjoy. I will see you all again soon.